President Obama. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> that's a nice start. Eh? Uh, let me welcome you on behalf of HIFAS and APC. It's a pleasure to have you all aboard and we look forward to working on to make this workshop a valuable experience. Um, many multi-stakeholder forums at the national, regional and global levels have been established in order to provide a way to collectively addressing the common concern of how the internet is used and is managed. These are not always successful. Therefore, this workshop will ask what are the key challenges multi-stakeholder forums like the IGF face in ensuring and transparency and accountability in decision-making processes. Hereby, we will focus on one, on two May. Hello. Hello. Hello, Alice. No? I'm sorry, I don't know her. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, so, we'll focus on two main questions. First, what mechanisms or steps are essential in realizing accountability, transparency in these fora, especially the IGF? And how can transparency and accountability be strengthened in internet governance fora like the IGF? So, concrete suggestions, please. During this workshop, we will have a look at uh, quite different perspectives. Each panelist will give a short presentation of five up to ten minutes max. Um, please make notes of your remarks and questions because after the five presentations, uh, four till now, um, qu qu questions will be taken. Um, we would like to have an interactive session by allowing enough time to exchange experiences and respond to questions. And for your information, after this workshop, a launch event will take place, amongst others, the presentation of the new annual report, Global Information Society Watch 2012, with the theme, Corruption and the Internet. Okay, we have re representatives of strong stakeholders in the room. Let me start with a quick round of introductions. Um, from the private sector, I welcome Pedro Les Andrada. Uh, Pedro is Latin American Policy Council of in charge of pol public policy and government affairs for the Spanish-speaking Latin America at Google. Is that correct? Yes. Great. Pedro is, amongst others, professor of the South School of Internet Governance. And um, next is uh, the representative from the technical community, Sebastian Bellagamba. Welcome. From ISOC, the Latin American director. Sebastian worked in the internet service providers industry. Currently, he's a member of ICANN's su address supporting organization council, being the chairman of the council for the last two years. That's still correct. <laughs> and from the perspective of international cooperation, Paul Maase, coordinator of the Open Government Partnership. Paul worked earlier with HIFOS as a team manager of the ICT Media program. Paul has been appointed as a first civil society coordinator for the Open Government partnership, OGP. OGP is a multilateral <laughs> initiative that aims, amongst others, to secure concrete commitments from governments to promote transparency and empower citizens. Then Alice Muyua is, I think, still in the main hall. Yeah? Okay. Then um, for the non-governmental sector, we have Luz Goud. Welcome. Uh, he's head of the C Bureau Culture and ICT Media at HIFOS, a foundation for, also for whom I also work. The Dutch development uh, agency HIFOS is based on humanistic val values and operates worldwide. So, let's start. Um, I'd like to uh, invite you to give a short presentation on your work related to transparency and accountability. And please elaborate, uh, especially on the last question, uh, how can TNA be ensured in uh, IG4 like uh, the IGF? Um, yeah, I would love to, uh, that you can conclude with some two or three concrete suggestions of lessons learned or other insights. Um, so I would like to give the floor to Pedro. He will focus on the driving ideas behind the Google Transparency Report initiative. This will be used as a tool to contribute to increase IG transparency and even fight corruption. Um, I'm very interested to hear more about this because I didn't know <laughs> about it. And yeah, please, Pedro. Thank you very much, Thurman. Uh Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you today. And 
the idea of, uh, of my presentation is to basically introduce you to Google's transparency report. You can, you can find it at google.com slash transparency report. And basically, wh 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 what, is the, the, what is the transparency report is a, a comprehensive da database of all the requests that we receive from different governments on the removal of different kind of content. Uh, Google is, uh, why, why we think that we need to publish this transparency report? Well, I, uh, Google is providing people and governments with more data so they can better understand how laws and policies affect access to information. Uh, more transparency will lead to uh, better internet regulation because uh, we can see how laws plays out on, on the ground. Um, and also the data allows, for example, us to judge whether existing laws are relevant or effective uh, and if they enhance or erode fundamental rights. Um, using this data, we can hold policymakers accountable of the laws they enact and how those laws are enforced. Um, we try to lead the way in this effort. Uh, we are, for the moment, the only company that is providing this kind of data. Uh, and uh, we think that other companies and governments should, should follow this kind of, of initiative to share more data about this kind of request. So which are the, diff the different ty type of requests that we handle and that we show in this transparency report? We, uh, we have government removal request, which is basically made in a country by country list uh, uh, that, and, and we basically showcase the, the request that we receive from governments to remove certain type of contents. We update this site with data in six months increments. And we are continually looking for improve this tool and provide more information about this type of request. This also includes judicial, not only the request from the executive branch, but also judicial requests. So you can, you can go country by country and see which are the different kind of requests that we receive. And also we have, a, then we have separal, a separate kind of information that has to do with copyright. And and this is particularly important when we when we are discussing, you know, the need of more copyright enforcement or the need of reform copyright copyright law. There you will have the you know the right numbers of how many copyright requests we are receiving and how how, how much we are processing and how this the, the system with the help of technology is helping to you know to 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 resolve central issues and also it's a way to to tell the users what happened with a content that they cannot find because ha something happened. And this also is, is part of our transparency. When you search for something in Google and you cannot find it because it was removed, you will have a notice also. And we also work with different, not, not, not only with the transparency report, but we, we also uh, work with other organizations to show, for example, how the DMCA, which is a copyright law in the US, is implemented. Um, and, and so we also work with, with third parties on this. Um, then uh, we have user data requests. When governments are doing investigations, criminal, for example, investigation, and they ask for IP addresses or certain type of information. So we, we, not, we, we showcase all the requests and also then we showcase for what, what, what number of requests we complied with. And you will see that usually the number that we complied with is smaller in comparison with the total amount of requests because many of those requests are either uh, uh, without grounds or against certain set of human rights. And I don't want to generalize because it's very difficult with so many countries and so many cases, but many cases this is what is happening or the requests are very overbroad uh, or um, or sometimes the requests might be clashing all the rights 
and will need you know to be addressed in another way for example with a judicial uh, they, they need to be appellate or the, the, and this is what what we are doing with on, on on that sense and then the other the, the other part is uh, our report on traffic and how different internet services provided by Google might be blocked or limited or in some way uh, obstaculized in different countries and particular moments. And we have different examples, you know, during political upheavals in different countries, and I won't, I won't mention any in particular, but you will imagine, we can show how internet suffered for a blockage or a limitation in traffic on different services like YouTube, like search. And this is also, it's incredible, but it's, it is also a great tool that help us to detect if something is going on in some place. Well, I'm very, you know, they are, they are in, you know, in the Arab Spring, you can, we can see how the numbers, the, the, the traffic of YouTube suddenly drops basically because the country was disconnected from the net. And then we can see how what happened in, in other countries with Twitter when, we, when in 2009 when they were discussing the, the, you know, the validity of the elections and how servers like, like YouTube or like Search or Blogger were completely blocked. Um, and so this is also a way to, for for journalists, for bloggers, for different opinion formers, to see what happened with, with with in their in their own countries with the with with the technology. So this is in a nutshell what what is about the transparency report. I think that it's much better than my explanation. So go online and look at it. It's it, it really it's explained for for itself. And uh, we try to you know every time improve it. We are going to launch in a couple of weeks our new edition uh, you know every six months we, we we launch a new report so um, hopefully we will have some improvements and we will we will be able to to show more information thank you very much Pedro um, I would like to move on to Sebastian um, and you will talk about uh, your experiences with ISOC in, um, in promoting transparency and accountability at internet policy global spaces. And I um, understand you will make a comparison between the mechanisms, the task force and the uh, uh, IGF. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, yeah I think we, we have to, to realize something first about the IGF uh, itself. Because uh, and the IGF is not a decision making body. Uh, so that is something that has to be addressed first in order to understand the, the whole picture. Uh, I think uh, tra so transparency has a new meaning in general, and 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 has a specific meanings for different for different kind of uh, events or or situations. Um, so uh, in this sense, um, for the IGF particularly, the big difference between other 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 fora is that uh, IGF is not a, a decision making body. So I'd like to uh, make a, an approach on decision making bodies because I, I think transparency there is quite relevant. And how the concept of uh, transparency has changed in the past, and I think that is due to the internet itself. I mean, the internet has brought a new environment in where the whole concept of, of transparency has changed. And mostly when it relates to governmental action. Um, governments used to be, I mean, some governments used to be more transparent than others, but even the most transparent governments used to just inform afterwards civil society or, or what happened. Now, uh, we as civil society, meaning, I mean, defining civil society as a non-governmental actor, I mean, it's a very broad definition, but uh, just please uh, accept this uh, definition for, for a minute. Um, we consider ourselves being part of the technical community, not the civil society itself, but uh, that, that is too complicated and just put the governments and the, the rest for, for, for a minute. Um, so um, we, we found out ways to interact with intergovernmental organizations or with governments itself in order to increase the transparency of the, of, of the, uh, of the processes. I was saying that governments just released information afterwards. Uh, that was uh, 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 a couple of years ago, until a couple of years ago, that was being transparent. I mean, fully access to the information, past information, something that happened. Uh, and we were happy with that. Now with the new tools and the new environment, that has changed. Now we 
uh, want trans real time transparency. We want to participate, and we have the tools to transparent to, to participate. Um, so in that sense, IGF uh, is, a, is a good example of transparency. I mean, even not being a decision-making body, we are aware beforehand, and we have the means to participate. Many people is today participating in this forum remotely, uh, in real time. Uh, that is that is awesome being a, a, an intergovernmental uh, body. I mean, uh, we have to, to, I mean, even being a, a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, event, this is, um, and a UN body, a UN, a UN event. So we are under the UN flag, and this is an intergovernmental organization that is allowing this. This is not for free. This didn't happen out of nowhere. We had, we as civil society, we work a lot and we fought, uh, we fought a lot in order to achieve this. Um, there is, I, I think there's good examples on, uh, there's good and bad examples on improving transparency in decision-making processes. Uh, we have uh, achieved that couple of good uh, good ones. Uh, we are working very closely with uh, the OECD, for instance, and the OECD had a very big internet economy meeting last year, and the, uh, the Internet Society was in charge of what is called, uh, and is now called, uh, the um, ITAC for the OECD, uh, the, in the Information Technology Advisory Committee, uh, which gathers together the, uh, the technical community, bas basically, uh, and, and, and provides counsel to the OECD, which is good, and we are heard now. And we participate in the in their internal process. Even, I mean, OECD is not exactly an intergovernmental organization, but there is governments that are members of the OECD. Um, there is a, a you, most of you have heard of Wicked, uh, the coming Wicked in, in, in Dubai. I mean, there is some changes even in the ITU processes. ITU has been a very, very, very close organization. Uh, not, I mean, even if you are not a government, but you are an ITU member, you are not. You are very restricted to participate. But now, uh, ITU has decided uh, this year to release the documents, to make the, the documents uh, that uh, for the preparatory process of the of the wicked to make them public. It's not enough. It's not enough because I mean, uh, there is public consultations without knowing the documents that you are going to be consulted on, and that's uh, there is a lot of things that still have to be fixed. So, um, bottom line, uh, it's, um, we, we strongly believe that um, bottom-up open processes with participation of all interested parties are, are essential, but are much more difficult to, to achieve. The multi-stakeholder bottom-up way is not the fast-track way. Uh, it's very slow. It's a very slow process because it has to iterate consultation many, many times in order to uh, achieve and, 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 and to get all interested parties' opinions into, in, into the process. Um, but what we've seen so far is that um, it's the most efficient way, even if it's the slowest, it's the most efficient way in order to achieve uh, solid and, and perdurable uh, results. So we, we strongly defend that, that, that approach in, in, in every forum. Would you please uh, open up your... You need some more patience then, or is it... More than patience. Yeah, it's more. It's more than patience. I would say. I mean, it's, um, it's more interaction and it's more willingness to cooperate and and, and, and to understand each other. Because I, I think it's a, a a multilateral way to to interact. And it's not about you expressing your opinion. It's you expressing your opinion and listening to someone else's opinion. Even governments. I mean, and, and if we are uh, asking for equal footing. We also have to give e equal footing to, to others in, in our own forum. So it's a matter of um, uh, uh, taking and giving, I mean, uh, and, and, and being open in many ways. Being open, I mean, uh, arguing and asking for openness, but also giving openness away. I mean, it's, a, it's an interactive way of, uh, of, of working. It takes time, but it produces uh, good results. Okay, thank you, Sebastian. <laughs> That's very clear. Um, now we will go to uh, Paul Maassen um, about the perspective of a specific public-private initiative, the Open Government Partnership, um, addressing issues such as access to information, open data, open government linked to internet governance. Thank you, Monique. Um, I'd like to start with showing a small video makes my life easier afterwards.
that sort of shows the basic of, um, of the Open Government Partnership. And, you know, it's a very positive video, and I think that in a way shows the essence of what the Open Government Partnership is about. It is um, how can governments and civil society and the private sector join forces to work together on transparency, uh, on participation, and, and in that way bring accountability uh, into society. But it's also very much, it, it's, it's sort of an idea born in the, the campaign of, of President Obama when he ran in 2008 about how can we use technology and bottom-up organizing as a new way to restore the connection between uh, government and citizens and citizens and society. Um, down the line, I think what OGP tries to do is, is to, of course, start at this conceptual level of transparency and participation brings accountability, but very much bringing it down to concrete commitments at national level that in the end should lead to actual change in people's lives. Um, there are three, three core pillars in, in OGP, I think, which makes it interesting also as a, as a model to reflect on here. First, in design, it is a multi-stakeholder model, but it also brings um, the same level of responsibility, ownership, and decision-making power from the start. So at the international level, there's a steering committee which has as many members from government and civil society, and they jointly decide where OGP is going. At the national level, governments cannot be a member of OGP without involving civil society in the private sector. They can, and many countries have done so in the initial phases in struggling with really involving uh, civil society, but it is an obligation and they will be sort of uh, reviewed on it, which is the third part of it. So you have multi-stakeholder in its design, it's countries making concrete, tangible, stretch commitments around transparency and accountability, either to improve public services, to improve public integrity, to work on corporate governance, to work on resources, public procurement. Um, so there's a whole range of issues that are part of, of open government that, that governments can, countries can make commitments about. And the third one is independent review. So the commitments made will be reviewed once a year independently from the outside to see if government not only delivered on their commitments, but also if they took the principles of OGP seriously. Have they really made an effort of involving civil society in the private sector in developing the commitments and in delivering the commitments? So different than many of the UN models where there's sort of a let's get everybody around the table and start negotiating um, model, which can take a long, long time, as we've seen in the, the World Summit on the Information Society, as we still see every year in the climate negotiations, the OGP is basically a pledge and review mechanism. So internationally, uh, a broad framework is designed, but then it's up to the countries, the societies basically, to decide, okay, what does that mean for my country and what pledges do we want to make? So I think on paper this all sounds good, but OGP we now have one year and we also have the experience from on the ground, and we see that it is a much, much more difficult uh, than it looks like, of course. Um, there are 57 member countries, 58. Argentina joined uh, yesterday, so 58 member countries to OGP. Almost 400 commitments. But if you ask civil society, are these the right commitments, then 72% of civil society says, well, they're not bad, but important ones are missing. And what that means is that um, governments have the tendency to go for the relatively safe commitments initially. Part of that is, is due to the time pressure of, of OGP, but you see there are a lot of commitments around um, e-services, there are a lot of commitments around open data, uh, access to information, um, but at the same time there's not so much around asset disclosure or uh, natural resource management uh, or corporate responsibility. So they stay on the tech side almost, but are not comfortable yet with making promises around the social side of open government. Why would civil society be interested in, in OGP, and I'm civil society coordinator, so that's, that's what's sort of most important to me. Um, I think for a number of reasons. First, we see across the globe that the space for civil society basically is declining. Um, and OGP, because of the model and how it's designed, just creates, gives civil society at national level space to talk and to work with the government. So that's one important reason, I think. Second, it's 
a tool, it's not a goal in itself, but it's a tool that civil society can use to push for the things they were pushing for already and try to get the government to commit to concrete commitments that are measured every year. So it's not just fighting to get a seat at the table and getting promises and leaving empty-handed uh, or with promises, but actually turning them into commitments. And, and we see in a number of countries that it has managed and helped to, to get traction on things that were stuck. Uh, like the freedom of expression, uh, freedom of information law in Brazil that now finally is in place. And we hope similar things can happen in uh, Ghana and in, in the Philippines. Um, the US was doubting for a long time if they should join the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. And in the end, because of OGP, they did. Uh, because they wanted to, as the ini initiator, show uh, some big commitments. So it gives you space and it gives you a way to, to nail down concrete commitments. Um, and in the end, why I think it's really interesting is that basically OGP is about um, creating space for change agents in the private sector, in civil society, in government, to, to basically work on a culture change over time, which is very difficult, both on the government side, that where, you know, where many actors are not used to working with civil society as, as equal partners, um, but it's also difficult for civil society because being part of developing the commitments is one thing, but then after that, not going back to the comfortable seat on the outside where you can easily criticize government, but, but staying inside and being part not only of the development, but also of the implementation and the monitoring of these commitments is also a culture change, I think, on civil society side. So how does that link to internet governments? Well, OGP is about open government, so it is, and as, as I said, many countries make commitments that are based on the internet and mobile phones and technology and innovation. So the internet is there and the governance is there as well because it's about open government and transparency and accountability. But internet governance as such as a concept is not a prime topic for OGP. Um, but OGP is what we, all of us, make of it. So if in certain countries the topics that are part of the internet governance agenda um, are key, are important. If we talk about internet freedom, we talk about um, media ownership, if we talk about transparency in the telecom sector, if these are the priorities of a country, then they can be included in OGP, but that's up to the actors at national level. To conclude, I would say OGP can really be about the topics we discuss here at the IGF the whole week, um, but that really is up to us to decide that the topics we talk about here are the important ones. And I think they are, because if you look at how governments now approach technology in OGP, it really is the easy way. It's, it's, it's in a way seeing um, citizens as, as clients of services they deliver and seeing how they can use technology to be more efficient and more direct in doing that. Um, it's about seeing the economic value of open data and seeing if it can sort of lead to, to entrepreneurs and, and uh, dynamic, which is great, but there's a lot more to be done. Um, so the role of civil society and media is once government, for example, release this data, to pick it up, to make sure that the citizens understand it, to translate it, to publish it, to, to create apps around it, whether it's I pay the bribe in India or MapLite in the US, which is a brilliant website where on the one hand, they show w how much donations a candidate gets, and on the other hand, they show um, their voting behavior in Congress or the Senate. They leave making the connection up to you, but just by putting the data out there, I think they also already contribute to tr transparency and accountability. So OGP gives a structure that um, civil society actors and governments can use to progress transparency, participation, and accountability in their own countries. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. But what can the IGF learn from OGP in terms of transparency? Um, I think one of the things that make OGP a strong model is the pledge and review model. Uh, it also has its annual um, gathering in a similar places like where we are uh, this week. But the fact that in the end, there's discussion, there's exchange, there's learning, but it comes down to, okay, what concrete promises are you making? Stretch commitments, so not what you already have in your plans for years. Um, and independently, from the outside, being checked every year, if you're delivering upon them, 
I think that is uh, what, I, what IGF could learn. But I'm not sure if it's possible with IGF, but you know, I think that's, that's an interesting thing. Thank you, Paul. Um, so now I move on to Lou, next to me. Um, he will talk about how transparency is included in the HIFOS Transparency and Accountability Program. Thank you. Thank you for being here and attending this session. Um, HIVOS, the Humanist Institute for Development Cooperation, is an international organization based in the Netherlands, but this office is uh, all over the world. One of our core programs is the Expression and Engagement Program. The program is made up of interventions to promote internet freedom, to enhance transparency and accountability, and to support independent and alternative media in the South. All of these programs are focusing um, in, in, in expanding the space for expression. In all these areas, stimulating the use of new technologies has been a pol policy priority for many years now. Currently, HIVO supports around 16, in 16 countries, around 62 projects and initiatives from partner organizations. I will try to address in this session two questions. What does it mean to be transparent, transparent and accountability, accountable in the internet domain? Because we all know, and it was already addressed by some of my colleagues here, that transparency does not lead automatically to accountability. And secondly, what mechanisms and steps are essential in re realizing accountability? We believe that the free exchange of information, space for expression, and opportunities for active participation of citizens are essential conditions for the development of a democratic society. Citizens are the drivers of change. That is why the road to a democratic and accountable government starts with their demands being heard. Accountable governments answer to their citizens, are open in their affairs, and can be sanctioned when they fail to do so. By amplifying the voice of the citizens and by empowering individuals to speak out, HIVOS interventions in this field seek to make this happen. Still, we all know, good governance remains an elusive principle that is very hard to enforce in a top-down fashion. A bottom-up and citizen-led approach is needed. Reco recognizing that civic agency is both a call in itself and an effective instrument in, in encouraging responsible governance. The two pillars of our approach to transparency and accountability are one, citizen engagement, and two, the use of smart technologies. As an active member of the Open Government Partnership, HIVOS encourages governments to open up and stimulate dialogue with civil society. The other way around, additionally, our programs are are meant to, to, uh, to stimulate civil society to do so from their end and increasingly support the development of new tools and know-how to make sense of the enormous amounts of data released through many open data initiatives, already mentioned here. In general, I think one of the largest challenges in the field of transparency and accountability is to ensure that the increasing accessibility of data will result in actual social impact. How can data and information made available through modern technologies be utilized by traditional lobby groups, by human rights groups, by human rights defenders to express a clear demand for change so much needed in many, many countries still? In this data translation process, we try, and others will do that as well, to act as a broker and to bridge the gap between the old and the new agents for change. We do this by concentrating on four themes. First one is citizen access to information. In the space of less than a decade, a strong movement for the right to information and access to basic data has sought to expand democratic space and to empower ordinary citizens to exercise greater control over the use of state power. We support various civil society organizations engaged in this effort to contest corrupt and arbitrary governance. One example is the Association for Democratic Reforms in India which makes use of India's Right to Information Act to generate as much information as possible in the public domain on the conduct and policies of political parties. Our second theme in this is service delivery. Delivering clean water and offering adequate schooling are among the core duties of any state, a responsibility that many governments nevertheless fail to live up to. Thankfully, for instance, in in East Africa, it's becoming increasingly clear that public pressure and debate are more effective drivers of change 
and foreign expertise or policy-driven techno technocratic reforms. Our partner, he was partner, Twaweza in, in East Africa, meaning we can make it happen, works in an ambitious 10 years program to provide practical information to everyone, to foster quality independent media and citizen monitoring services and holding and doing so holding governments to account in the process. Our third team is election monitoring. In theory, elections are the formal mechanisms that citizens use to voice their satisfaction or dissatisfaction and to punish or reward governments for past actions and future promises. Clearly, in many countries, this mechanism doesn't function as well as it should, and together with others, we are seeking to address this. Citizens often find themselves to be little more than bystanders in the electoral process. The scrutiny of these processes being in the hands of trained observers or neglected altogether. Our initiative, ICT Election Watch, together with Ushahidi, based in Nairobi, Kenya, changes this by allowing voters to directly report intimidation or incidents through text messages to a central platform. Together, these messages, more than 30,000 in Uganda's latest election, make up an imposing report of governmental misconduct, causing politicians to think twice before they meddle with electoral affairs. And finally, our fourth theme is combating corruption. Corruption practices can be deeply embedded in political and legal systems, we all know, undermining checks and balances away from the public's, public's watchful eye. For instance, Indonesia, Indonesia's Corruption Watch intends to mobilize the country's numerous anti-corruption groups into one influential national corruption net network. The organization raises awareness on the government's patronage of powerful business interests, supports the development of a clean bureaucracy, and scrutinizes the appointment of judges to ensure the availability of fair redress. Concluding, focusing on these four teams using various innovative methods and combining the force of both new and traditional actors, our strategy on transparency and account accountability brings more accountable governments within grasp. In all these fields, internet, be it fixed or used increasingly mobile, also everywhere, also in Africa, internet is playing a crucial and indispensable role. Access to information and data is internet-based. To enable citizens' control on service delivery in East Africa, Tuaweza, for instance, develops mobile web-based tools. Together with Ushahidi, we develop the Uchaguzi monitoring platform and anti-corruption initiatives are developed on dedicated web platforms and special apps through which ordinary citizens can protect themselves against corruption, empower citizens to hold the powerful to account and mobilize against corrupt rulers. Concluding, an open and non-restricted internet plays an increasing role in enabling the free flow of information that forms the foundation of a more open, transparent, just and accountable society. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Thank you all four for the great presentations. Um, is Alice in the room at the moment? No, she's not. Well, then we go to our first Q&A. Um, I learned a few things, but uh, we'll first we'll give the floor to the to you. Um, please state your name and to whom you want to address a question, then we can answer them. Gloria, I'm from Colombia. I'm here as a social so, uh, civil society. Um, I have three questions. I don't have no idea if I can. I can answer three questions. For all of them? Yes, for yeah. all. First, um, you give us some examples about open government and social society and civil society participation, but how can other governments have knowledge about this? This is the first question. The second one is, how can we, as a civil society, force an implementation of open government tools or mechanisms in our countries? And the third one, 
uh, how can we as a social so uh, as a civil society uh, get guarantees about open government implementation tools okay thank you um, shall we who wants to start yeah, I can, can pick in, uh, on the first one yeah please yeah, Sebastian. I, I just gave a uh, good examples when I referred to OECD and what ITU did with the uh, wicked but um, there is also bad examples <laughs> and uh, and bad examples are that um, ended up in a good in a good way I mean um, if you uh, look at the history of ACTA the anti and anti fighting agreement that was being discussed in behind closed do doors by a bunch of governments and how the civil society reacted to 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 that I mean I'm basically to the fact that there was the being discussed behind closed doors and how ACTA failed or um, also the TPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement, which is also copyright kind of agreement that is being discussed by a um, club of, of, um, of countries and is also I mean, facing um, some reaction from, from civil society. I think that's, that's the right way to, to engage. And, and also regarding your second question, I think uh, engaging, wi engaging with the governments is a matter of so also of interacting. I mean, approaching to governments and asking for 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 being participated. You cannot sit down and, and wait for the governments to open the door to you. Uh, you have to engage. I mean, you have to be proactive. Uh, the um, the multi-stakeholder, open and transparent way is not the, the the usual way for governments. Even if they have good willing, in order to to open their processes, they don't know how to do it because they're not used. So we have to help them. Yeah, Pedro. Just a, uh, a quick note on, on top of what Sebastian said. In connection with TTP, which is basically a free trade agreement um, that, is, uh, that is negotiated regionally for the Pacific, the countries that borders the Pacific, uh, there is a question of transparency even with within the government, which is very complex because it's the executive branch that is negotiating this behind closed doors. And the Congress has no idea what's happening. We have a great example on Mexico on this, with ACTA, that was just focused on, 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 on intellectual property. The, 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 the Senate in Mexico demanded the executive to show the text. That was not possible that the government was negotiating that without opening it up. And that was the beginning of the end in some way of, of ACTA when different you know, legislative bodies start to demand the same, the same treatment. So this is, this is interesting how sometimes the transparency is a problem also within different governmental bodies. Thank you, Pedro. Paul? Yeah, I think part of the, the answer is that you can, in your structures, you can get it right. I mean, OGP has, has the structures basically for all your three questions, but that doesn't mean it automatically happens. For example, on the learning, what OGP has is um, peer exchange, so new countries that join are brought together to learn from each other, together with countries that already are in, in uh, the system. Um, it also has a networking mechanism where countries with concrete questions can ask OGP and the community for assistance in, in solving it. But the difficulty is really in matching the demand and the supply and for governments to sort of define what they want to know and where they need help. I mean, the, the answers are out there. Um, so I think that's, that's an important part of it. Um, and then you're talking about how can you ensure that governments uh, deliver and really wants the openness. I mean, there are no guarantees. And, and in the end, what we're talking about is culture change, right? I mean, you can have concrete commitments. They can be on paper. They can be submitted and reviewed. But in the end, if the people in power and the people in the democracy and the people in society do not truly want to change to open government, then, you know, it will not happen. So the structure can deliver a lot of things to make it easier. Uh, but in, in the end, it has to come from the from the national dynamic and the national governments. Yeah, Lou. Yeah, just a few uh, remarks on this. I think it's a 
very essential for civil society involvement in this to choose different um, um, strategies. One strategy could be indeed following and lobbying and, and advocating on the side to the and get in a dialogue with the government and the private sector on OGP, on, on internet governance and, and other international frameworks. On the other hand, it's, I think it's very important also to choose a very concrete uh, point of departure to get the, the issue more real for many people. Because if you talk about with ordinary people about open government and about um, internet governance, well, it seems far away, and does, does it really uh, make a difference my, in my life? But if you choose for a very concrete topic, be it, for instance, service delivery in the field of water, or in the field of health, or in the field of edu education, and promoting transparency on these issues, then it becomes a real-life thing, and I think that that's very important. And I think civil society, in collaboration with media, to reach out to many people, can play a role, a very important role in this. So combining these two elements, it, I think it's, that's very uh, crucial. Thank you, Lou. Does this answer your questions? No? Uh, yes, but uh, I have a follow-up question. Yes. <laughs> of course, continue, please. Um, if a country has a social, uh, civil society who is empowering themselves with tools and ideas, I don't know, and they are interested on build tools to open government, it would be possible in, in a way. I don't know, maybe an organism must support these initiatives. You know, what, do you know what I mean? No? <laughs> okay, again. Okay. Uh, for example, in Colombia, um, past year, uh, past year, one year ago, uh, we had a Yeras law to censorship and internet, and uh, and we, as a social society, uh, was fighting in the Congress, and it the it that was a similar case uh, that Mexico uh, Parliament have no idea what they are singing or what they are approving. But they have to approve because we have a we have an, a commercial agreement with the United States and we have to approve or approve. And when the senators uh, know we were recording and tweeting, they got scared because they know at the end they are uh, these opinions and these tweets are both for the next campaign. So uh, in this case, I am putting an example uh, about social uh, civil society interested on a topic, and uh, uh, and we have not mechanisms or we have no resources to build a, a tool. Yes, we have the we have the desire, we have the knowledge, but we have no support. And I don't mean just economical support, just other support, and international support that can empower social uh, civil societies to build this kind of, of tools to make open governments possible. That's what I mean. It's, I think it's very important or could be interesting to, to have a, an, an international organism that allow this. I mean, I think the example you give shows that, you know, in this example at least, you knew exactly what to do, and it, you know, it worked. Um, what I think is really strong usually is, uh, for example, how it works in, in open government partnership is that there are civil society players in, in all these 60 member countries that are um, uh, trying to work towards open government in their countries, and they, they're all on the same mailing list, and if they have concrete questions, they just ask each other, and that's a way uh, how you sort of build support within civil society. Um, and for example, in, in Latin America, there are a few very active networks, regional networks across countries that do similar things. Um, so that's sort of the, the knowledge side of, of support and, and tools and, and, and sharing ideas and inspiration. And on, on the financial side, I think also in, in, in Latin America, there are a few of the more 
technology-oriented um, funders in the region, like the Omidyar Foundation, um, that I think are exactly interested in, in sort of bringing together advocacy and technology. So that, that could be one where you could, uh, could reach out to. Anyone else of the panel wants to? Mark? No, I'm, I'm I'm just shared my experience in Colombia in that in in that uh, in the treatment of this of this bill. It was a copyright bill that has huge problems in terms of free expression, and it's right. Once once we start to engage with Congress and basically civil society and different stakeholders, and also private sectors start to engage, uh, and basically the public opinion was the main driver uh, of a change in the course of this bill that was basically pushed by the executive and because they have majority in, in, in both chambers that was almost seen as a, as a deal done. And, and you know, it was incredible how, you know, the engagement of civil society, they, they basically uh, uh, started a, an open session at the Congress. We have the chance to speak there. And this then was you know, distributed and broadcast in different ways for YouTube, Twitter, different social platforms, and it really make make a difference there. It was was really really interesting how, and at the end, you know, the outcome was that the that the Senate decided to with to stop treating this bill, and because they understood where was the, what what was the consequence around this. So, uh, but it was it was very difficult for civil society to really get a voice, to really get the means, uh, to really get funding to, to be heard. Also, so this is something that you know will be crucial for for developing countries, you know, to work on. Any other follow-up questions, <laughs> or yeah, enough. So, anyone else? First two. <laughs> yeah, um, Hanana. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Hanan Bujami. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Internet Governance Program with uh, Hibos. Um, I just have a <coughs> maybe a comment on uh, Paul's um, a note about how the internet governance process um, can feed into the OGP initiative. Um, I think uh, the concept is is quite new, you know, but it's it's very interesting, and I think it links to uh, the uh, current internet governance discussion because it's linked with access to information um, as a right first. So it has this human rights uh, perspective to it. And I think um, it is uh, the um, favorable environment for, um, you know, um, the OGP initiative to be discussed because it enhances, um, you know, governmental um, providing uh, people with the right to access information. And I think that's the essence, you know, um, establishing the OGP initiative. But at the governmental level, now you're trying to engage civil society in the discussion, which is already good. The problem is in some countries, people are not aware of their right, you know, to access information. So uh, there should be some um, awareness raising through multimedia material. Like you prepared, the video was really uh, to the point, and it shows people um, exactly what is the outcome of the OGP initiative. So I think it's just a matter of, of, of you know, um, doing more outreach, you know, within civil society organizations already involved in um, uh, internet issues in general. Um, and I think that should help pave the way for the initiative to take off and, and to be, you know, more of a consistent um, uh, theme that we can, you know, follow up all the time when we come to the IGF to, you know, speak about where do we stand, for example, from um, accessing um, information or the right to access information. I'm sure all of you know that it's uh, usually a provision in the national laws of countries, but most of the countries don't have that, especially in you know, least developed economies or developing countries, which I believe you have quite um, a substantial uh, number of, of developing countries joining the process. So raising awareness about that happens as a governmental level. Um, obviously, it has a leadership, but when you, you come to forums like the IGF, it's good to tackle and engage civil society in the discussion, but through to the point, you know, uh, messages like the video to show them exactly how it can help, you know, uh, reaching certain uh, rights. Yes. <coughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Please. Well, uh, I'm uh, Tamir Miligi. I'm from the uh, Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, actually, I was just uh, going to ask the, th the same thing in a, in a different way, that we have first to increase the uh, number of internet users uh, in developing countries in order for us to, we cannot, we cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot deal with open uh, government uh, while the internet users are uh, are the minority, and from this minority, uh, we start taking actions that's affecting the rest of the country. So uh, this is this is one thing. First, the right to access uh, internet, uh, and also uh, one, uh, and and also so we, so we have we have this right uh, internet internet access literacy rates in developing countries that are needed to be raised in order to reach in the future the uh, open government partnership uh, initiative uh, another thing actually uh, was i mean i followed i followed the egyptian revolution for instance when i was abroad um, uh, so i followed it through the internet i followed it through the media in a way uh, how can we as users uh, whether whether telespectators or internet users, protect ourselves from uh, entities who use uh, the internet and who use the media to manipulate and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the ideas in, in, in the minds. I mean, when I came back to, to Egypt, I had a certain image about what was going on. But when I was on the on ground, I realized that uh, most of it was, uh, I mean, was magnified in a way. Uh, I cannot say that it was totally wrong, but definitely it was magnified. So how can we, uh, as users, protect ourselves from the manipulative media, the manipulative uh, uh, I mean, entities who use the internet to, uh, uh, to lead the people in different directions? Thank you. Thank you. For to whom you are addressing this question? Uh, well, I believe all of them. Okay, right. <laughs> Who wants to start? You, Pedro. You know, I think that the the best way to deal with with this is that the wonderful thing of many internet platforms is that there has no mediators. You know, it's just the people. Oh, so if you if you're in a country where the traditional media might be biased and might be controlled by certain industries interests you might want to empower the proliferation of information society services that that are going to be uh, based on user generated content and that has you know no no interference for for third parties and for this to that end it's very important to start to set up certain set of ground rules in terms of intermediary liability, uh, in terms of you know free protection of expression online, all that, all, 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 all those, all, all, all those initiatives will be will be, will help to basically uh, create a, a, a good ecosystem to generate you know a, a platform for you know for for uh, civic engagement because at the end of the day, what what it counts is what. What, what the people is there is telling you, you know, what, what, what is going on. I think that you might, might get more, more feedback from the social networks and real info from social networks or for, or for different kind of services rather than for, for the news. The problem that it was that that was shut down also. So then, then you need to, to build, uh, you know, very important institutions, very important principles so you assure that that uh, that that tool will remain open and available. Okay, thank you, Pedro. But uh, yeah, okay, yeah. then Luke first. You know, responding to your first remark on the, the need also to uh, to have uh, attention for the uh, access uh, issue, I think that, uh, that you're, you're completely right. That still remains a very important issue. At the same time, you can observe that also in Africa, for instance, uh, the, the access to mobile phones uh, has increased enormously 
I think uh, currently one third of the population in, in Africa has, still a, has access now to mobile. That means that uh, different from these initiatives we are talking about uh, currently, uh, it's very important to also uh, include mobile mobile access uh, to this initiative because that will mean that a larger majority of the population can, can profit from this. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Lou. Um, Paul? Yeah, following on the same point, um, I don't think we should wait with open government till everybody is online. I mean, open government is also its policies, its its media, its um, uh, th there's a whole social element to it. There's an entrepreneurial element to it. So there's much more to to open government than than internet. So that's one. Um, does that mean we should not? try to get the same information to people that are not online sure but you know that's a role where where libraries can play a role where media can play a role um, but let's not let's not sort of wait for that to happen um, and I think what you should also keep in mind is that with if you if you limit open government to sort of the information the releasing of information then I think yes there's a direct link between the information and the end user but there's also a link between the information and the media, and uh, between the information and civil society, and the information and the private sector to, to take that and to use it and to amplify it and to react on it and to advocate with it. So, like Lou said, extremely important to continue getting more people online, but let's not wait with open government to get started. Thank you, Paul. Sebastian? Yeah, just um, adding up, but uh, I think of open governance, to make it more general, um, will uh, is a driver to to to, uh, to generate more di more access. I mean, uh, so it's a uh, it's a uh, um, I mean it, 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 it's a good thing to have in order to improve the access conditions. And regarding the second point, I think this is not a panel. I mean, uh, maybe it's not the, the the panel for for freedom of expression, but uh, I think if uh, there is manipulation and it is there is obvious manipulation, increasing the offer will be the solution in t instead of uh, decreasing the o the offer of information. That's uh, a general principle. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Valeria? Thank you. Uh, Valeria Betancourt from the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, it is very interesting to, to listen to the examples that uh, Sebastian have given in relation to, um, to how some of the global internet uh, policy public spaces might be uh, being opened and more transparent and more inclusive in terms of participation of different stakeholders, particularly civil society. But I am interested to know uh, in, in your experience uh, if that uh, phenomenon is, going is, is also being reflected at the national levels. Uh, uh, because I was also interested by the comment by Paul that uh, the civil society space seems to be shrinking at some at some level so in your experience this what is happening at the national levels in terms of 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 of, of, of uh, using the multi-stakeholder approach uh, for transparency for increasing transparency in public decisions on internet policy related issues i mean the the in general, I think the space for civil society is shrinking. And you know, for example, the Freedom House reports that come out every year sort of uh, describe that clearly. Um, around transparency and accountability, I think because it's built in in uh, the OGP model, there is space. But what you see is that the first round of action plans, where consultation with civil society is obligatory and not just you know putting it on the website, but real consultation. And you see that you know some countries just didn't do it or only did it online, for example, right? Which is also a way of excluding a lot of uh, people. And there is not a logic in the type of countries. For example, my own home country, the Netherlands, just didn't do a consultation. They're doing it now, afterwards, and, and, and with good intentions to refine the action plan, but they didn't do it the first time. So I think for governments to really think through what it means being basically the difference between consultation and partnership, I think, right? Consultation can be what 
what civil society in a way has fought for for years is having a seat at the table when big policy changes are made. Uh, and that, you know, often happens. But being a true partner in, in deciding what the country's priorities should be and then as a next step when these priorities are defined in implementing them, um, I think is, is difficult for both civil society and, and government. And, and one example is, for example, Albania has um, an amazing action plan around OGP. If it's going to happen, I don't know. Uh, but it's amazing. It's, it's turning Albania into the first e-state, 100% e-state in Europe, I think. But the first thing what happened when health data, which has been public for years, health data from, from, the, world, uh, from the World Bank reports, when civil society decided to take them and put them online because Albania wanted to be open around data, the government freaked out because now suddenly this quite negative statistics about the health situation in Albania was a lot more accessible. And their reaction was, hey, wait, this wasn't the idea of being part of the open government partnership. Well, actually it is. It is a first, perhaps uncomfortable step in working together as civil society and government. And, and, but the reaction was the old one. So it will take time. Okay, yes, please. Microphone. Hello. Yeah. No. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Renny and I'm uh, with the Chinese Foreign Ministry, like my Egyptian uh, colleague. Uh, I, I found uh, this morning's uh, the panel discussion very uh, interesting, very useful. Uh, thank you to the uh, panelists and, uh, in fact, uh, congratulations to the participants as well. I have just basically one comment and uh, one question. Uh, one uh, comment would be, uh, basically I want to echo what has been said by my Egyptian colleague regarding the uh, internet go uh, governance, the the uh, ki kind of like the precondition uh, for this uh, internet governance. If you want, we want to discuss this issue. The, the precondition, the, the 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 first thing to, to do is to provide the the infra infrastructure, the the <laughs> the, uh, the platform where, so the access to internet for people, especially from developing country countries, is a very important issue that we have to to bear in mind when we discuss this and uh, think about the important significance of the access to internet uh, by people, especially from the poor countries, less developed countries. Uh, I think it's, it's an important thing. Uh, and also the, the, the issue he has emphasized or highlighted on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the measure to, to avoid, to prevent the uh, use of the internet in uh, transmitting uh, uh, messages. I think that this is also an important issue. This is quickly, this is in a comment, uh, questions regarding the interpretation or the definition of accountability. I, I noted uh, one of the panelists uh, has uh, so somehow explained that uh, the uh, transparency plus participation equals accountability. This is a very interesting. But on the other hand, m personally, I feel that uh, this is, uh, uh, explanation is incomplete because when you say accountability means that uh, uh, decide, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the right, for example, to, to, to access information, data, uh, and also the right to participate in, for example, policy uh, or decision making. On the other hand, um, I mean, the oblig obligation or, or the responsibility uh, aspect should also not be, I mean, at least ignored. So I would like to get some more uh, well explan explanation regarding this uh, 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 term of accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Who will? 
Who wants to answer first? Oh, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, I, say <laughs> <laughs> I think you're fully right in a way. Um, the, the, the sort of transparency plus particip participation equals accountability is sort of the catchphrase that, that open government partnership use. But I mean, it's a lot more complex than that, of course. I mean, who is accountable to who? Um, at what points is it just government being accountable to the citizens, or is it is it is it a much broader concept? So, I mean, I think it it goes too far in this session to to um, um, academically explore what accountability is. But I think you're right that it's you know it's a it's a much more difficult concept than just putting information out there and giving space for people to do something with the in information doesn't automatically bring accountability, but it helps bringing accountability. Anyone else? No? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to respond to your remarks on, on uh, the abuse of information uh, because um, <coughs> I think I just want to support and to, to repeat a bit what's said here earlier that um, internet has made, is, is making a real difference when it comes to access to information. I think it's very important that um, all actors, including governments, including all governments, should uh, recognize that the time that governments can decide on what information is available for people or not uh, has passed. That's, that's history. Internet has made accessible every information and it's upon citizens to decide uh, to uh, access information or not and, and on, upon citizens to decide what, what's useful or not. It, it, it creates um, many, many opportunities to, to access information in, in different ways and to, uh, to get your own preference for it. So I think um, governments shouldn't be that, uh, so be so afraid for the abuse of information. They should allow citizens to decide for themselves. I think that would, would be a remark that I would like to make uh, around accountability. Thank you, Lou. Um, in the interest, interest of time, we are um, going to uh, round up. Um, I think we heard many different contributions from several perspe perspectives. Um, I would like to give the last word to the panelists. Uh, yeah, you were waiting for that, I saw. Um, uh, maybe you can, from your perspective, give them um, uh, one suggestion or insight that can be used to yeah, improve the transparency of this IGF. Please, Pedro. Um, not not just focus on the IGF, but an idea that I think that is something that is uh, an, ac an economic approach to open open data, and is that we are f we are seeing that the open the when the government opens the data, they are providing new raw materials for the development of different information society services. So some governments right now are in the unique opportunity to basically create, create wealth from their own information. And if we think about the development of different apps in cell phones, if, uh, that you maybe will, will, will be fed by you know, traffic information that c will come from a public ministry, or you know, different, uh, I don't know, the, the, the number of people that is waiting in a, in a hospital room, so you can check if which is the hospital that you have to go if you have an emergency, because you have, you know, a less a, a less amount of waiting in some hospital or in another. And there are, there are many many ways that you know that information that has can be on you know on the hands of the government will create wealth, will 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 foster entrepreneurship. Uh, so it's it's maybe it's a side effect, you know, or you know, uh, but it's but it's a, it's a great one. And we can tell there are really good examples in Chile, for example, how you know young people is starting to design up uh, applications, uh, publicly available, that are you know using uh, op open op open op open information. And here is also the question of open open formats as well. You know that any open government initiative should also embrace you know open formats, so everybody can can enjoy that 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 information as well. Thank you, Pedro. You mentioned also the economic value also from open data. Do you want to add something or want you your final remark? No, I think I, I fully agree with, with what you are saying and, and it goes back also to what Lou was saying is that 
it is really about about trust and about dynamic and you know the, the, the open society open government I guess you can only get when everybody is involved and that starts with one of the things where it starts is with being really open about the information you have and just see what happens I mean don't be afraid of, of the things that can happen okay don't be afraid mm -hmm. Sebastian yeah basically I think uh, we're facing a, a change in the paradigm and some things are, are changing and we cannot stop them and we have to get used and we have to take profit of that I mean it's a more um, Collaborative. I mean, the internet has taught us uh, to be more collaborative than we used to be, and so we have to take profit of, of that collaboration part of it, and that's that's the challenge. So don't be afraid and be challenged. Um, I think um, I have to thank you all very much for what? Oh, oh so sorry, <laughs> Lou. <laughs> Just a quick <laughs> final remark. Um, it's. it's it's maybe in some way it's easy to talk about uh, transparency and accountability. Uh, what you preach, you should practice yourself, and that's uh, why I'd like to ask your attention for the fact that as a funding agency, HIVOS, uh, recently, one month ago, released all its project data in open data format, according to the standard of the IATI, which is stands for the International Transparency Aid, Aid Transparency Initiative as a non-European, we are the first large European player that has opened all its project data. Uh, around 1,500 projects uh, are now online with all the financial data. I think that's, well, just uh, just an example of uh, practicing what you're preaching, like Google is doing with its um, Google Transparency uh, Database. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for sharing your insights. Um, and I wish you a very pleasant and interesting IGF, productive also. It's lunchtime now, but I, however, I do hope you, most of you will stay because the next event of the, on the agenda is the launch of the new Giswatch report 2012 on internet and corruption. Um, yeah, um, for those who have to leave, uh, thank you very much for your presence. And for the others who will stay, I hand over the microphone to Valeria. Yes, to you. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah.